absolutely go for it, but do it with the right support. Like don't try and do it on your own because there's going to be stuff that comes up where you need some support or you need maybe a bit of a push just to, to take action. There's so many people out there looking for a good way to sell. So if you can do that, then absolutely go for it. So Stephen, let's start with where you're at now with your business acquisitions. What do you own? And then we'll work backwards to figure out how you found the businesses, how you funded them, and how you got the deal done. Cool. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so right now we're at four acquisitions. So we've done four complete acquisitions. Um, some of them are share sales, some of them are asset purchase. Um, but ultimately what we've ended up now with is two functional businesses because we've done a couple of mergers and we've disposed of one. So as it stands right now, we've got two active agencies. They're both creative agencies. One is in more branding and identity side. Um, one specializes in the care sector. And um, so, yeah, we've got two, two teams, um, effectively about 14 people across the, across the business. And uh, we're on track to do probably around one and a half million pounds over the next 12 months. So we're getting there, getting started. We've got a good platform to start from now. That's excellent. So what was the time frame then from doing that first deal to today? It's been a little while. So I suppose the first deal ended up, I mean, I really got started with this probably January last year is when I sent my first batch of letters out. And then we ended up doing the first deal. We signed the papers and everything for the first deal in July last year. So it's been quite a while to get there. And then we did a second deal in August. Um, and then subsequently, we've done another two deals this year. One we saw, well, we actually started the, the very first lead we got. We started the conversation in March last year, but we only signed it now in January. Um, and so that's technically our third acquisition, even though it's the first conversation we started. Um, yeah. So some of them take a little bit longer than others. Um, and since then, we've just signed another deal in July. Okay, that's fantastic. And so that would be the, the fifth one. Yeah. So that, Great. So, so what I think people find interesting about your story is that these businesses are in the UK, but you live in France. So I, I know that presents certain challenges. We can talk about those those later. But what was it that made you decide that buying a business was something that you wanted to do? So, yeah, I mean, for a long time, I've been sort of running my own business. I had a, I had my own custom software agency back in South Africa many years ago. And then I was co-founder and kind of ran the operation side of, you know, relatively large and growing business. Um, it was technically based in the US, but we ran it remotely. Um, so I've always you know, for a long time, for the last sort of 15 years, I've, I've been running a business of some sort, whether it's my own or, or as a partner. And I think somewhere along the line, I've always wanted to have multiple companies, wanted to sort of own. I think for a while I wanted to run multiple companies. I'm far more of the opinion now I'd rather own multiple yeah, companies. Sure. There's, and there's a big difference between owning oh, yeah. and running. Yeah, <laughs> very much so. And um, and I think when I, when I decided to leave... Um, like I was, I was COO at a, at a company, you know, we're a team of 26, we were doing about $6 million a year and uh, we'd built a really good business. And I decided, I think it was time for me to sort of move on and look for something else. And funny enough, that was in the self-development or personal development field. And I actually came across a webinar of yours that was promoted by one of our partner speakers. This was probably October, 2022. Okay. And I think listening to that webinar, I'm like, oh, this is possible. Didn't even realize there was an option. And uh, so that's kind of when it, when it kind of hit me that like I could do this, um, that the possibility was out there. And so when I left that company at the end of 2022, I started the acquisition side. So that was January 2023. So you joined Mastermind in January 23? So I think I signed up late 2022 at okay. some point. And then, yeah, we got started in January. Um, and uh, yeah, so I was attending a few of them online from from South Africa at the time. Okay. And then try to get to a few in person. But yeah, really kicked it off from probably January was really the first time I got to one of the events. What I often tell people is one of the hidden benefits of a program like the Mastermind program are the people that you meet. And it's really hard to put a value on that. But I consider that value to be absolutely enormous. So just talk for a moment about the the people in the room and the friendships and colleagues that you've you've made. Yeah, I mean, so it was an interesting one because I started a little bit on, you know, through the online, just watching the YouTube videos and so on. Um, but I was in the LinkedIn forums and I was getting connected with people and having conversations, which was great. But I think it really kicked off when I got to the in-person events yes. and made some personal, you know, sort of face-to-face -face meetings, um, you know, connected with a lot of different people. 
you know, all on the same kind of journey at varying levels, um, which is great. And I think I've made some incredible contacts through that. Um, you know, we've we stayed in touch all the way through, mm-hmm. you know, and it's it's this sort of idea of learning from shared experience, right? Because everyone's at a different stage in the journey along along acquisitions, wherever they might be, putting different deals together, maybe they're in different sectors and so on. And so just chatting about that um, brings a different perspective to things. And often you realize like you're getting stuck on something that somebody else has found quite easy. So you can they, just they ask solve the problem. And, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's been hugely, hugely valuable. Yeah. Fantastic. So so you joined Mastermind, decided to get serious about this. Um, you uh, got out there talking to business owners. How many conversations did you have, if you can remember this, before you found the first deal or, the, or one of the deals that you did? Because you said, that one of the first people who spoke to you actually completed as the third deal. But um, how long and how many conversations did you have until you found something worth pursuing? Quite a few, I think. Um, it's going to be difficult to remember how many, but sure. I sent, I'd sent out, um, so probably started in January last year, I'd sent out um, batches of letters. I mean, so following the technique you teach in the, in the academy. And we started off with, I think, a thousand letters at a time. And I sent about two or three batches. Um, and so I had quite a few conversations of that. I want to think it was in the range of about 30 to 40 conversations. And, you know, the, it was quite an interesting one because it was very much a learning curve right from the start. So, you know, I'm experienced in running business and the operations side, but having a conversation about buying a business was quite new to me. So it was definitely a, a, a learning curve as we were getting into those conversations. And that's actually very interesting because we have people who are very experienced business owners and they've done everything in business except buy a business. And yeah. it is a, a, it's a, a different skill set, isn't it? It's an additional skill set. And yeah. actually, it's coming back to me now because I remember you at one of the live events saying that you'd had 30 conversations with, with owners. And everyone was very impressed because you, know, you were taking action. You were, you were out there talking to people. And d- did you not find, though, that after the first six conversations, you get into a flow and th- the confidence is there after those first half dozen calls? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, I think the first call was a little bit intimidating. Sure. Uh, it was actually really helpful that uh, they just, some, uh, some off the back of my letters, somebody just picked up the phone and rang me. So it was really a bit easier than having to pick up a call you know, and actually phone somebody directly. Yes. Um, so that was good, but it was it was a case of following the process. So I had a, I had built out my template of questions to ask based on, on the, the teachings in the academy. And so I felt like I was fairly prepared for it. But of course... When you get into the conversation, sure. <laughs> it's it's a new experience. Yes. So it took a few calls to kind of dial that in. I think I did benefit from having the experience of working in entrepreneurial coaching before in one of the businesses. So I I got comfortable talking to business owners about their strategy. So it was a similar kind of conversation, but very different sets of questions. So I was asking about their business, but the biggest thing I found quite different was asking about their motivations for selling. Yes. And so, yeah, it took took a few calls, probably about four or five to ready to get into the sort Mm -hmm, of flow mm -hmm. of it. And, um, but with volume, definitely the practice helped. And I think by call number six or seven, it was, I was happy to jump on a call and just chat to it. You were an expert. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Felt like it. (laughs) (laughs) So you found the first business to buy. What were the circumstances of the seller? So, so the first deal we did um, was a conversation. It wasn't the first conversation or not wasn't the first one in the pipeline. Um, well, in fact, maybe t- let me take you back to um, a previous one where we almost signed a deal, but we ended up backing out. Okay. Um, so that was the very first one. We started having a formal discussion and uh, I met up in person with the sellers. Um, so we ended up walking away from this deal, but the, the motivations were, were quite similar across the other deals that I've done to some degree. And it was really, it was owners that had built up a good agency that worked for a while. Um, and now they were looking at some sort of retirement options. So they were looking to get out of the business one way or another um, and looking for the right partners to do uh, or to exit with that. So I found that's been a common theme for a lot of the owners I've spoken to. Mm-hmm. That and the other one is just on the distressed business side where the owner just wants to get out. So the very first deal we started to progress and we, we got to a heads of terms, we almost signed it and then I ended up backing out of the deal. But the motivation for the sellers was was really that, is it was that they've they've had a good business, they've worked long and hard, they've worked many years and they're just looking to to basically retire, but without just, you know, 
basically stop trading and dissolve the business. And I think once they'd received my letter, they realized oh, it's an option to sell. Mm -hmm. so they hadn't really thought about that. And um, yeah, so the discussion was really about how we could sort of help them achieve their goals through, through a sale of the business, for them to be able to retire and structure it in a way that makes sense without forking out loads of fees to, um, you know, to uh, consultants and so on to kind of facilitate the deal. So that was really the primary motivation for them. Um, and then moving on to the deal that the very first deal we actually signed, it started off in a similar conversation, but it very quickly moved to the owner just wanted out, um, just a business that was fairly distressed and the owner just wanted to do like, kind of hand the keys over and run away just about. Sure. Um, they just didn't want anything to do with it anymore because it'd been through COVID and lots of some personal challenges and so on. And so it was just a case where just didn't want to run the business anymore. Understood. So, so you know my feelings about distressed businesses. I do. <laughs> and we can talk about this for a moment because you know, the, the, buying, a, buying a business where the owner is distressed is very different to buying a, a business where the business is distressed. So it's a true. distressed owner is someone who's at retirement age, um, can't, can't see any sort of succession plan with their children, their grandchildren, and it's what do I do with this business? And it, it costs you money to close down a business. It'd be far easier just to sell it to someone else. So you've got this this distressed situation where the the owner just wants to get out for whatever reason. And quite often health and goes hand in hand with retirement. So then we've got the distressed business, which is on a knife edge financially. Maybe it's losing money. It's got debt. Uh, and these are two, and maybe the two do go together, but they are also two clearly uh, defined situations. Now, I always say the businesses that, that have the debt, that are on the knife edge, that lost in customers, they've got some issues. You've got to have a really thick skin to be able to manage all of the emotions in that situation. Plus, you've got to be comfortable with the fact that it's not going to be plain sailing. Now, you quite clearly have a thick skin and you're comfortable <laughs> with it not being plain sailing. So, so tell us about navigating a distressed acquisition. Yeah, I mean, those, every time I think about it, I remember your, your, your messaging and every, every workshop I've been in, you've always stressed like, you know, don't start with a distressed business and ideally don't look at distressed companies. Um, rather always the distressed owners who you've got a good business and they're just looking for a way out. 100% agree that that's the better option. <laughs> um, I think with my with my situation being in you know remote work, living in France and, and working in the UK, it's added some challenges. And I thought, well, I've done a little bit of a turnaround. Um, well, I've managed to sort of fix a couple of broken businesses in the past. I thought, okay, okay. well. So you had some experience yeah. of that, yeah. So I've got some experience from the operational side of helping fix businesses where they've had challenges. And so the first deal that we signed, I was chatting to the owner, and it was a situation where it was both a distressed business and a distressed owner. Mm -hmm. And um, so I knew that going in and we were having a, a discussion. And I think one of the core things that's driven me for my, most of my career now has been just helping other business owners like achieve some sort of success, whatever that might look like to them. And rightly or wrongly, I think, you know, that has popped up for me now when I'm chatting to the owners because I see a problem and I'm trying to help solve it. And um, definitely a learning curve in there for me as to how much of how much of the pain I want to take on myself. Um, but, you know, that at the time it felt like, okay, well, I, I can see a solution for for the owner here. And I feel like I've got the experience to kind of tackle this one. And I also, but I was very careful to look at the downsides, like what are the risks attached to this? Mm -hmm. And I very carefully looked at like, okay, if it all goes very south, then I can just walk away. We'll buy the business for a pound. We'll, if it all goes horribly south, we can just shut it down and walk away. Sure. So I was, I was very sure to limit any downside from that. And, and it was very clear that it was a real possibility that we wouldn't be able to fix the business. So you went um, in eyes open yeah. to the possibility that this might be too much for any, anyone to handle. And if it, if it came to it, you could just close the business, walk away, no personal risk whatsoever. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, and I made sure I did all the things like follow the correct company structure and make sure we set up everything correctly to to minimize any potential risk. And yes. as you say, going in knowing knowing what I what I'm walking into basically. 
Um, of course, you never really know until you're in it. Sure. But, um, and it's always worse than it's being portrayed. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, it's always worse than you think. As much digging as you can do from the surface level, stuff's sure. gonna, you're going to find stuff on day one. Stuff's going to keep popping up. Yeah, over the, time. Uh, the, the desk drawer full of the bills that haven't been paid that oh, yeah. you didn't know about. Yeah, yeah things like that. But um, it worked out that we we ended up getting like a really an amazing team out of it. Um, the people are fantastic. They're still part of the team today. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, we managed to get in there and kind of stabilize the business. It's taken a lot of work. Um, and I mean, this is from July last year, we closed the deal. We're only really stabilizing it now. So it's taken quite a lot of time and effort to get there and quite a lot of structural changes to make that happen. So it's been a long and difficult path and it hasn't really made us any money yet. But for me, the upside is, you know, one day if we sell the group, we this is this is positive upside. So I feel like it's been worthwhile and we've managed to save a couple of jobs in the process. We carried on serving some clients. And so it's worked out. But it's definitely been a steep learning curve. And yes. um, I'd be very cautious with any other additional uh, sort of distressed businesses where the business itself needs to be more substantial than what we took on mm-hmm, on this. Because mm-hmm. I don't know that this one, as much as we've solved some problems, I don't know that it's necessarily worth the amount of effort we put in, sure. aside from having effectively found a really good set of team members. Like the team are fantastic and they're part of my team today. So that's been the biggest win out of the whole lot. Um, but yeah, it's definitely had some challenges. Yeah, and no, I understand. And you compare that to buying a a business that's that's doing well already, it's profitable, it's profitable despite the owner be, not being there. So you can, the, the owner isn't instrumental to the operations of the business. And you've got something that makes money day in, day out. Yeah. Uh, that That's really what the, the ideal business 100%. to go after, isn't it? Because it just cuts the whole curve of turnaround, which yeah, you know, turnarounds work and turnarounds don't work. And, and there is that always that risk. Buying a business is difficult if you're doing it by yourself, but do it with others. It's so much easier. Mastermind gives you the knowledge and the confidence to buy your first business. Absolutely guaranteed information in the video description below. Tell us about um, the best deal out of the ones that you did. The one the one that you feel that was the most upside. Maybe it was the easiest one to do. Tell us a little bit about that one. It's a, it's a good question. I think there's, for me, there's a bit of a toss up between two of them. So one being, um, we closed a deal, or we started the discussions back in March last year. Um, well-established business, they've been operating for about 20 years. Um, they got a good team um, and it, it seemed like a really good deal. We put everything together. We followed all the normal processes. We did the due diligence and the legals and all of that. And we put together a really good deal. Um, it did have some risks that we were well aware of, like quite high client concentration and again, agency services. Um, and so we managed to factor all of that into our agreements and we made sure we covered any possible downside. And it's turned out to be a pretty good business. Um, a couple of challenges obviously taking on a business is, um, you know, it's a change of ownership. You know, there's generally change happens and, and sometimes sure. unsettles some things. Yes. But overall, it's been a really good transition and a good join into the group. Um, so that's been a, go- a really good deal. Probably, I- I'd say, one of our best. The other one, I'd say, it's, it's maybe a little too early to tell, but we've just signed this deal in at the end of July. And again, an amazing team, really great people to work with. And it's been such an easy deal to kind of put together, but it was an asset purchase. It wasn't a share sale. So we've managed to bring um, effectively the client base and the team over to merge into one of our existing businesses. And it's been such smooth sailing. We've just been doing onboarding in the last month or so. And it's just been like a dream deal. It's been, it's, everything's gone together really easily. Um, the team are great. We get on really well. And it's a great addition to the culture that we already have. So it's maybe a little too early to tell, but I think this deal is, is one of the better ones for sure, just because it's been so easy. Um, and do you think part of that though is you're now more experienced and you know what to look for, what to avoid. Maybe you're more discerning now (laughs) than you might have been a year ago. I I think it's a combination of that and also just who you do business with. I think there's a big challenge or a big difference between if you connect with owners that are, that you align really well with, um, generally you can immediately align quite well with the team and to the culture lines up quite well. And often if you do work with people you, you know, like and trust, it's just a whole lot easier, right? Um, and so, 
but definitely the experience has played a part in that. Getting to getting to quickly build rapport with owners around a, a structured deal, um, kind of knowing what you know, having built on the experience of doing a few deals in the past, I think all of that does help. Um, so certainly following the processes and getting experience in the belt has helped. Um, but yeah, just working with great people, I think, makes things sure. easier. And I think if you've got if you've got enough sort of deal flow, I know you talk about this quite a lot, is having deal flow. Um, you can be more discerning. You can Absolutely. pick and choose which You're deals you want to work with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How is your deal flow? Um, it's it's slow at the moment. We've actually taken a deliberate step back at the moment just so we can stabilize the businesses we have in the group right now. There's a few things we need to do to build our team to be able to cater to onboard the next acquisitions. So we'll probably kick off deal flow again in the next sort of what, two to three months um, and start going from there. And what we'll do would in another podcast, we'll talk about what happens after you bought the businesses. So we'll keep that conversation separate. So so let's go to negotiating price and terms. How did you agree prices with these owners? How did you agree terms? What did the negotiations look like? Were they face to face? I imagine they would have been possibly um, rather than email. I hate email negotiations. Oh, yeah. uh, but uh, how, how did how did it all work? So it's it's had a bit of a mix depending on the deals. So of the four that we've signed now, um, they've they've all gone a little bit differently. Um, I've tried to do as many of them as possible in person. Now, because I'm buying companies in the UK and I'm living in Toulouse in France, um, it does make it a little bit more challenging. Yes. But I try to line up meetings where I'll fly in basically. Thankfully, it's a short flight. I can fly in, set up a couple of meetings for the week and then head home. Um, and so absolutely initial conversation is almost always on the phone. It's just generally not a Zoom meeting, it's just a phone call mm-hmm. to kind of just kind of get a sense for where the, where the seller is at what the sort of outline of the business is. And that's part of the qualifying process, I suppose you could call it. Um, Once we've had a few discussions like that, then I'll try and meet in person to actually run through a lot more detail. This Between the phone call and in-person meeting, I would have asked for all the financials and a bunch of information. I'll go through that and then we'll have a proposed deal structure. Then we'll head up to an in-person meeting and we'll run through what a potential deal could look like. And the price negotiations and the terms it all depends on what the owner is looking for. So what we do is we try and work with the owner to find out, uh, find a solution that is, you know, it's a win-win for both of us because we're trying to help solve a problem of theirs one way or another. Um, either that's looking, for, you know, for them to retire, for them to exit the business or to just hand off a business they don't want to be in anymore. Um, and so we'll try and line that up so that we win, you know, we basically put together a win-win deal. Sometimes there's some complications because a, a broker's involved and, and we have to factor in some commissions and so on. We've done that on on one of the deals now where we sort of negotiate around that. Um, but yeah, it's generally been an in-person discussion to do that. Right, yeah. And then usually a fair amount of follow-up, whether that's additional in-person meetings or follow-up mm-hmm. on, on a phone call. I tend to avoid email where possible. Great. I'll follow yes. up on email, um, you know, to make sure everything's in Like writing. a confirmation. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But, but it's not a negotiation. Um, and, and what you've just <laughs> yeah. described is the, is the classic deal maker's process. And I, I, I love it that you're sticking to that phone call right at the start, because I've seen some people recently say, well, you can do that on Zoom. And I don't think you should be seeing each other in that first conversation. I think the first conversation should just be a voice to voice. It's almost like it's, it's too much too soon if you go straight in with a Zoom call. So you're doing the, the phone call, you're getting the information prior to the meeting, you're having the meeting, you're following up. I mean, absolutely textbook process, Dean. Very good. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. I have done a few where the initial calls were on Zoom more recently. Um, I do prefer the phone calls first, I must be honest. Like, mm. it's great to have, um, if you just want to sort of meet someone, do a bit of an introduction, a Zoom call is great. Um, but ideally, to run through the list of questions and to get some clear information, I much prefer that phone call process first. And then I've got a script I run through, I'll ask a bunch of questions. Um, it's easier to do that on the phone before we get into a Zoom. And I tell you the reason why is because there's less rapport on the phone and you don't need that much rapport. In fact, I don't think you want that much rapport at the start because if you're going to position the negotiation, negotiating dynamic as you being the person asking the questions and this is your deal, that is harder to do in a Zoom call where it becomes way more equal. Um, you you need to have that upper hand on the phone conversation, which it can only be done on the phone conversation rather than the Zoom. That's my theory behind why the phone <laughs> yeah. call is always better at the start. Yeah, I mean, I, 
that's a good point. I hadn't thought about it like that. And I think if I if I think about the Zoom calls versus phone calls now, like the Zoom calls have always been a bit more casual and a lot mm-hmm. more about getting to know each other and kind of then the working rapport, through the questions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is great, but it doesn't really it doesn't really help you get through. Um, if you've got good deal flow, like you should have, um, you kind of need to work through them a bit quicker, and you need yes. to be a little bit firmer on on actually qualifying yes. a lead Absolutely. to start with. You can have a five minute phone call, but a five minute Zoom call is quite hard to end, isn't it? Every every Zoom call I've had is well, not not everyone, but a few of them have ended up being well over time. Yes, um, just because when I was. So when I was sourcing leads, and this was primarily through LinkedIn, which is I know a very different ballgame. I prefer the letter approach, but through LinkedIn we were doing some outreach. We teach a lot of LinkedIn now, by okay. the way. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, because it because it, it's it's always good to have more than one way of doing things. Yeah, for sure. And the two actually complement each other quite nicely. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so we were doing that, but then I'd end up booking instead of a phone call, booking onto Zoom, mm-hmm. and I must have I've done a lot of calls like that. Um, spoken to some amazing owners. Um, but it turned out generally because we end up having a good rapport and we end up just chatting about business in general and not necessarily sticking to the script to qualify them as a deal. Um, and so, yeah, so I do prefer the phone call method to start with just to kind of get a sense for is there a deal potentially here or not? And then follow that up with some information, some accounts and figures, and then jump into either a Zoom or ideally a face to face. Yeah. So when it comes to deciding price, how did you do that? And any tips for our viewers on how that can be managed? It's been an interesting one because I, as far as possible, I was trying to stick to the sort of script of saying, well, I don't want to know what you want for the business. I know what you, I want to know what you need for the business. You know, so when I'm talking to... That's a, a good uh, piece of scripting, by the way, Stephen. I wonder where <laughs> I wonder you where may, have, may have heard that one. <laughs> but, it, but it's a great line, isn't it? It T- is. Don't tell me what you want. Tell me what you need. Yeah, it, it's definitely been an interesting one because... So with the deals we've done so far and a lot of the discussions we've had, um, people have got very different ideas of what they what they want for the business and what they think the business is worth. Um, I think there's a there's an element of possibly having spoken with, with the owners if they've spoken with a broker sometimes, sometimes with a friend or with their accountant. They've got, I would say, unrealistic expectations of what the market will actually pay for their business. I mean, we've seen small businesses that are entirely dependent on the owner and they're looking for three to four times EBITDA. Now, you take the owner out of the business, there is no business. And so sure. it's not worth that. Um, and it'll, and often they're not even being paid a, a, like a market-related salary. So you couldn't even replace them, the yes. work that they're doing in the business, for the same amount. So actually the business isn't worth anything. Exactly, yeah. Um, it might be worth something to you, but that's really a different <laughs> conversation, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. So that that's I found that is quite a hard one when somebody's got this expectation that their business is worth several hundred thousand pounds and then you tell them, well, actually, no, after you've made these adjustments, it's not really worth anything. Um, and that can be a little bit shattering. <laughs> mm-hmm, it's a mm-hmm. difficult conversation to have. But it's a, it leads well into then saying, okay, well, realistically then, what do you need for the business? And then you can be a little bit more ne- more sort of negotiable around how you can make a deal work. Because then it's not necessarily about how much you pay for it, it's how much, how mu- what a deal can you put together that works? So we then dive into the sort of cash flow of the business, what the financials look like, and what deal could make sense. If we can do seller financing, we'll look at, you know, we can be more flexible on the terms then we can give a better price, for example. So if the owner's happy to take a, a sort of a, a longer payout term, maybe over five years or something, then um, we can structure it in such a way that they get a much better price, but the, the terms are more preferable to us. Yes. So it kind of depends. You can generally be more negotiable on either price or terms, generally not on both. Um, so it depends on what the owners are needing. If they need money today, you know, it can change the price a bit. So, so what many new people to this subject don't understand is why anyone would accept anything less than all the money on day one. And what I explain is mm-hmm. that that is the starting point of, of any seller requirement, as it would be for you or I. If we were selling, you know, that would be our starting point. We, of course we want all the money on day one. Who wouldn't? Of course. But in the absence of other options, Plus that motivation, there might be age, stress, illness, just had enough, other interests, moving to another country, whatever it might be. 
then the option that you're presenting is always going to be better than to continue owning than continuing owning the business. I agree with that, and I think that the. the this is where the conversation and the negotiation becomes really important because you need to understand the motivations of the seller. You need to know what's most important to them and then you construct a deal around that. If the most important thing is going to be the money on day one, then you probably haven't asked enough questions um, because that's usually not the biggest factor. Usually it is something like they want to retire or they just want to literally sail off into the sunset, whatever it might be, you know, go and enjoy, enjoy some more freedom free time, not having to be in the business. Usually there's other motivating factors. And if you can find those and address those through a structured deal, usually the money up front is not as much of an issue. Um, there's certainly an element of owners wanting to cover risk. So if depending on how you're financing the deal, um, they want to know that they're going to get all their money. So, you know, whether that's on day one or not, and usually the usually they want more money on day one just to cover that risk. Mm -hmm. So if you can find a way to manage the risk as well as give them, you know, settle around the mo their real motivations for selling or getting out of the business, then you can put together a pretty flexible deal. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And it is, again, it's, fi it's finding that seller where money isn't the number one motivation. I mean, if, you, if you're finding a seller in their 30s, probably it is going to be the number one motivation. They've watched a lot of Dragon's Den and, uh, you know, they they feel they've invented the next Uber or Facebook. So, so finding the motivated owner where the motivation is something other than money gives that flexibility because it, it becomes it, everything becomes a lot more movable when you've got someone who says yeah i want to be on that world cruise in one month's time i've got to do a deal in four weeks otherwise i'm just going to lock the door and walk away from the business so identifying those people is really important and that deal flow really helps because the more deal flow you've got, the more options you've got, the more options you've got, um, the more likely you are to find those people. The, the worst the worst number in business is the number one. We've got one of anything. You've got one, yeah. one person doing something or one, one method of getting customers or one business to buy. If you've only got one business to buy, uh, you'll never get a good deal. So what have you learned about negotiating deals that would be useful to people watching and listening to this? Well, I think we've covered some of that already in terms of just really understanding the motivations of the seller. I think that to me is the number one thing. Um, the other thing is is probably that um, you're, you're kind of, generally when you come into a conversation like this, often you found um, potential sellers, if you're following the different methods of sending letters or reaching out on LinkedIn and so on, you're finding business owners who don't necessarily know anything about selling a business, have not necessarily sold one before. And so, you need to educate yourself, I think, as much as possible on the process so that you can be confident in in how this works. Yes. Because the moment there's any doubt in your ability to kind of facilitate, facilitate a deal, the owners will start to pick up on that and think, okay, well, you know, um, you know, is this going to work out? Yes. And, and it, it adds an, an element of risk to them. And then they sort of either their price will go up or they'll back out of the deal. Yes, I agree um, with that. So I tend to, I think, you know, you need to make sure you know what you're doing, uh, which again is Dealmakers Academy. I think is a good space to be in for that. Well, the, recently <laughs> there's been so much information on the internet from, from all around the world. I mean, when I first started running these programs, there's just a handful of sources of this type of information. And now there's like, it's like so much, but it's all free stuff on the internet. And what worries me is when people watch or listen to too much free stuff on the internet, they think they're now an expert. But there is a huge gulf and a huge difference between reading some articles, watching some videos, listening to some podcasts, and actually got having a structured approach so that you know more about buying the business than they know about selling it. Because if you sit down with someone who knows more about selling a business than you know about buying a business, <laughs> you'll come out with a deal, but it'd be a really bad deal for you. So you're absolutely right. Knowledge, very, very detailed knowledge is just so important. Yeah, 100%. I think the the more you can know about the process, the better. And and this is especially important if, you, if you're speaking with anyone who's already listed with a broker, you need to know the ins and outs of that. Or if they've involved their accountant in the process and absolutely. often... And often the accountants, while they may be, may be great at helping the owner run their business, they don't necessarily have experience selling a business either. Yes. And so you need to really understand how, how it works and how to structure a deal. And ideally, you need to understand the ins and outs of how to value a business. 
So you can have an informed discussion. And so when somebody throws a number at you, you can question it and, and get to the bottom of how do they get to that? How do they calculate it? And so you really need to understand the, the formula to put something like that together. So yeah, I think a structured approach to that um, and a detailed approach. I mean, as you say, there's loads of free stuff on the internet, but most of it is relatively high level, I'd say. Well, it has to be, doesn't it? Because it's, it's general advice for the whole world. Yeah. And so I think this this is part of the reason of being part of a mastermind where you can ask questions specific to the deals you're looking at and specific to the the, the sort of setup that you're on. Um, you can ask that in a group of people who have experience or they might have come across something similar or they can help identify gaps that you've missed. Um, it's really important to cover those off. I think so just getting the experience and the skills and the understanding that, that you need to put together the best deals. I think that's by far the biggest learning curve that I would say people need to focus on um, bef- you know, as they're approaching sort of buying companies. Um, and so the other key thing is you need to know what you want out of it. You need to know, because we, we touched on this earlier, like you need to know if, um, do you want to own a business or do you want to run a business? Because there's a massive difference in the kind of businesses that you can buy depending on what that answer is. Now, I approached it thinking I'm quite happy to run a business, but ultimately I just want to own it. Mm-hmm. I don't want to keep running businesses. And so I knew going into the deals that I've got, I'm going to have to be involved in the running, but I'm building a team to take me out of the day to day. And we're making pretty good progress on that. But you need to be clear on, on that. Um, the other thing is, is probably sector experience. Now you can do a very broad approach. Um, you can chat to owners. Like if you've got fairly good biz, overall business experience, management experience and stuff, I don't think it's too much of an issue, but certainly talking to owners in the sector that you understand you can speak the same language, which goes a long way to setting up confidence and you know between you and the seller. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so Stephen, people watching, listening to this, often are sitting on the fence. It's like, do I do it? Don't I do it? What would you say to those people? I'd say go for it. I mean, there's no, there's no harm in trying. I think that if you're keen to own a business and and rather. <laughs> I'd say, especially if you want to own a business rather than running one, I think this is a fantastic way to go is to buy in companies. There's so many people out there looking for a good way to sell, um, but they don't necessarily realize it yet. So I think there's loads of opportunities. Um, it's definitely been a very different experience for me from running businesses in the past. Um, absolutely go for it, but do it with the right support. Like don't try and do it on your own. Like I'm a good one for trying to do stuff on my own. And, but I understand the value of getting the right experts around you and having the right connections to help you because there's going to be stuff that comes up where you need some support or you need maybe a bit of a push just to, to mm-hmm, take action. Mm-hmm. And so getting the right support and the right environments around you is really important. So if you can do that, then absolutely go for it. Fantastic. What I'd like you to do is to come back and do another podcast with me where we talk about what happens after you've bought the business? Because I think people would be very interested in finding out what you need to do once you own the business. Stephen, thank you very much. It's been great talking to you. Excellent. Thanks, Jonathan. Good to be here.